I love the Lord Jesus and I love his word. Join me in his word, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I tell you, I'm, I'm right satisfied now. I, I, I really, I really, I'm really all right with going home now. <laughs> I, I, I really don't mean any harm, but I'm actually all right. I, so I tell you what, I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to hit this real quick. And I hope, and, and then we're just going to go. Because now I'm, I'm, my soul is satisfied now. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. My soul is satisfied. My soul is satisfied. I, matter of fact, that's what I'm going to I'm going to read the scripture. And we're going to come back next week, and I'll teach it. I ain't joking. And I promise I got a full, I got a full sermon. Got a full sermon. Got full sermon. Got full notes up there. So if you want to hear me preach, come back next week. But now, I'm, I'm really satisfied. No, I can't. I can't do that. I can't. I can't do it. Somebody need to hear the word, so come on, come on, let's, but now y'all raise up your amens and get me out of here quick, all right? Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt lose its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast aside and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel till a butt on a candlestick and gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Today's message, very briefly, is... Uh, the task for believers, the task for believers. Thank you so much, ushers. You may take relief of your duties. Jesus here, uh, Jesus here teaches us what a Christian disciple should be and that we have a responsibility as Christians to serve God. Jesus here offers to us an illustration of the desired impact in a world which desperately needs our witness and desperately needs to experience God's power. Our Lord's teaching here uh, shows that faith in God is more than just following some religious rules. Faith in God is more than just adhering to some sect or standards, but it is a continuous demonstration of commitment and a life that is given over to God to his honor and to his glory so that he may show himself great in our lives despite us living in a world that is decaying and dying all around us. Y'all say amen a little louder. Three things in the text that Jesus shows us that I think will help us in our Christian walk as we go through this week. Number one is that believers are meant to prevent spoiling. In verse number 13, the Bible says, ye are, that's what Jesus said, ye are, you all are, his disciples that he's talking to, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, where is it good for use? Jesus here shows us that uh, uh, we should prevent spoiling. The reason we say that is because salt, sodium chloride, is, is the most common uh, product or the most common compound that creates salt. There are different types of compound that create salt, but sodium chloride, chloride is the most common, uh, is a preservative. It's used to cure meat. It's used to put in open wounds that will take out the infection and draw out the poison out of wounds. It's used as a uh, med for medicinal purposes and for preservative purposes. And when Jesus tells them, ye are the salt of the earth, 
during this time when they did not have refrigeration like you and I have, they didn't have deep freezers like you and I have, that's the only way they were able to, to preserve their foods and preserve their meats. They had to pack it in salt. And when he says you are the salt of the earth, it means that without you, things will go bad and go bad quickly. And friends, can I tell you that that's the challenge that we have in the world today. Why the world around us is decaying is because the church and believers have lost our saltiness. It's the reason that, that there's so much crime. It's the reason that families are in a mess. It's a reason that, that, that uh, uh, husbands won't take care of their wives and wives won't take care of their husbands. Why fathers won't take care of their children is because the church... If anybody should have salt, it should be the church. If anybody should have the ability to pull out the poison and pull out the, the wickedness and pull out the nastiness of the world, then it should be the church. But Jesus says if the salt has lost its savor or saltiness in a, in a decaying world, and that's what God finds us in today like, Mose, uh, excuse me, like Noah in Genesis chapter 6 lived in a day when the very imagination of men had grown wicked, had grown cold and callous. That's the kind of world we're living in today. Y'all ought to say amen there. Well, Pastor, what do you mean that's the kind of world we're living in today? Well, have you looked at the news lately? Have you seen how people are killing one another in the streets? And I mean for no good reason, just walking up to people's cars, pulling them out and killing them right there, and then taking off with their car. That's a cold, sick, and decaying world. Amen. But Jesus teaches us here that in, that in that type of environment, we are most useful. But if we lose that property which makes us salty, then what happens is we become good for nothing. Salt that was useless during this time had, uh, th there's no way to pull out the salt and it's the salinity out of sodium chloride. But uh, in the day and in the area where Jesus was, what would happen is that they didn't have pure salt. They would extract the sea salt, but uh, from the places where they would extract it, there would be other minerals that would seep in and, and get amongst the salt that would cause it to not be as potent as it normally could be. And you know that's the problem with our Christian faith today, and that is that God can't find pure Christians anymore. We got too much of the world in us. We've got too much of ourselves in us. We've got too much strange ideologies in us. We've got too many false religions in us. And so therefore, because we have tried to intermingle, because we have tried to, to confuse ourselves and mix ourselves with the world, we are no longer as powerful as we could have been and no more as good as we could have been because we have corrupted ourselves with false teaching, false doctrine, and false attitudes. Say amen. But here Jesus says, here Jesus says, if salt loses its salt, and this is not good for anything. Salt was a pretty good uh, commodity during that time. As a matter of fact, the Roman soldiers, because salt was so precious and so rare to find, they would buy salt with their, uh, with their pay as a, Roman, uh, as a Roman soldier. So that's where we get our term uh, uh, worth his weight in salt, because salt had value. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the word salt in the Latin is salarium. It's from which we get our word salary. Uh, uh, that's what the Roman soldiers used it for. But Jesus said, if salt is not doing what it's supposed to do, then guess what? It's good for nothing, except for to be trodden, to be cast out and put under the foot of men. Do you know the lowest grade of salt there is, is road salt? It's the salt that they put on the roads during the snowstorms. You all live in Florida, and I thank God I'm a Florida boy because I can't stand snow. But in places where it snows and ice, the lowest grade of salt that they have is road salt that they put down that makes the roads uh, a little bit more easy to traverse. And, and in his day, in Jesus' day, what they would do with salt that wasn't good or that was corrupted, they'd throw it down on the ground. And that's how they came up with the term, all roads lead to Rome. It's because they had, they had salted those pathways that they had trodden over the years, and the vegetation wouldn't grow because they had thrown the useless salt down there. 
And Jesus says, if you as a believer, if you as a disciple don't have the, 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 the grace and don't have the blessing and don't have the, the conviction of God in our hearts, he said, then we are not good for anything except to be used as the most lowest form and the most useless form of salt. But he says this, he says, now, now uh, it, it's cast aside and it does nothing. But if it is still good, then it'll help somebody and it'll be useful. Then not only does he say we're salt uh, to preserve from spoiling, but number two, we, are, we have the task to shine prominently. Look in verse 14 and 15, shine prominently. In verse 14, he said, ye are the light of the world, a city that's set on a hill. Now, Jesus does something for me and he does something for you. He blesses us with a title that's given to himself. For Jesus is the light of the world. In John chapter, uh, y'all still here with me? In John chapter 1, uh, John described him as the light that lights every man that comes into the world. In the book of 1 John chapter number 1, John says that in him is light and, in, uh, and there is no darkness at all. Light speaks to the power of Jesus. Light speaks to the holiness of Jesus. Light speaks to the wondrous glory of Jesus. And Jesus does something for me and you as his disciples. He says that we have the light that he gives. You are the light of the world. That is a blessing because what Jesus shows us is that we have a purpose and a calling to not only preserve but also to shine and, uh, and to De demonstrate and display the glory, the grace, and the blessing of God. Friend, can I tell you something that the world does not want us to shine, but wants us to diminish, but God has called us to shine brightly in a dark world. His descriptive here about a city that's built up and set on a hill uh, could speak to Jerusalem, which you had to go through a valley to get to Jerusalem on either side. Jerusalem was set up on a high hill. That's why the psalmist asked the question, who can ascend to thy holy hill? But no matter if he's talking about Jerusalem or most other cities, most cities were built up high. And what would happen is, is that as travelers were coming from a long distance, as they were going down the long road, and if night fell and caught them, they could still find their way because they could see the lights from the city as it was setting up high. And they would find their way to safety by the lights that were on. So what Jesus is saying to us is, there are some souls that are out there that are lost. There are some souls that are out there that are wondering. There are some lives that are out there that are trying to find their way home. And you and I have to remember that the only way they are going to find their way is if we do like the red roof in and keep the light on for them. But the challenge is that a lot of people can't find their way anymore. Why? Because the church isn't shining anymore. The gospel that we used to have doesn't shine anymore. The life that we used to live doesn't shine anymore. The grace that we used to demonstrate and display, it doesn't shine anymore. And that's why people are wandering out in the wilderness trying to find their way home. But I'm, I told y'all earlier, I'm still old school. I still believe in letting my light shine before men. Come on, talk to me here. We used to sing a song, Brother Bear, when I was growing up, let your light shine. There may be someone down in the valley trying to get home. I know y'all are modern and new now, but, and, and you, you have your kids listening to everything but Christian music. But I thank God that I grew up singing songs like this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Come on, y'all pray and I'll get out of here. Let it shine. Let it shine. Why? Because somebody needs to see the light. And now understand this, that, that I'm not so bright and I'm not so beautiful myself, but I've got Jesus on the inside. That's working on the outside. And that's why I got a light. I'm, I'm nothing by myself, but I, if I've got Jesus on the inside, then people ought to see some signs of it at some point. If you're a real Christian, then people ought to see some light around you. But you know what I've come to discover? That everybody that calls themselves Christian is not a Christian. Because darkness covers them. Because darkness comes in the room. Have you ever seen people that as soon as they come in the room, it seemed like a dark cloud came in? It's because they don't have any Holy Ghost. They don't have any light. They don't have the power of God. In Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 8, Jesus said, or Paul says, For you are, were once in darkness, but now 
You are light in the Lord. And so walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light results in all goodness and righteousness, discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Y'all listening here? Everything is exposed by the light and is made clear. For what makes everything clear is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and the Messiah will shine on you. Paul teaches us very plainly that the challenge that we have as Christians is that when we shine, the darkness has to run. You, you all grew up rich, but if you ever uh, lived in a house where they had, you know, them little friends that we have, You know them little, them little brown friends? Y'all know those little brown friends in other people's, other people's houses, don't you? But, but you ever seen them when, when the lights come on? They scatter because they can't stand the light. Can I tell you that there's some people that's like that? That the reason, that reason they don't like you is not because of anything you've done wrong, but the truth about it is there ain't nothing but some roaches that are just crawling around and they like darkness. And when you show up, the lights. I wish I had a witness here. I have to remind some of my preacher friends all the time as I'm, as I'm sharing and encouraging them. Keep preaching the word. If you preach in the Bible, line on line, verse on verse, then what happens is that the light is going to shine in some dark places. And some folks that have been doing some stuff that they should not have been doing, some people that have some attitudes that they ought not have, will get uncomfortable and they'll run and hide. But... Those that are real Christians, those that really want to serve God, instead of being like vermin that run when the light comes on, they'll be like plants. And you know what plants do. Plants are drawn to the light. Plants will bend toward the light. Plants will grow toward the light because they are growing in God. Can I get a witness here? And that's what I want to be. I want to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruit in my season. And I don't, I'm not scared of light. I thank God for the light. Shining in the darkness of my soul. Shining in places where, where, where I need the light to shine. I thank God for friends that I have in my life. I thank God for family members I have in li my life. I thank God for church members that I have. I thank God for my wife because they, they will shed light and say, No, I wouldn't do that, Adrian. No, the Bible says this. No, the word of God says that. And you know what? I thank God for that because when I'm in darkness, I need the If you don't like people telling you the truth, there's something wrong with you. If you don't like people shining the light on you, there's something wrong with you. And you need to straighten up. We should be grateful for the moments when we are not thinking clearly and when we are not seeing correctly, when we are not uh, uh, in, in accordance with God's word because uh, well, to have people that will shed the light and that will give a good Christian witness to help us find our way. May be uncomfortable, but we thank God that it's necessary. And we as Christians should never diminish our light. We should never, we should never stop shining the light. This is what Jesus says in verse number 15. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lamp stand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. Jesus knew and they understood exactly what Jesus meant. That in their day that uh, uh, they had, they had uh, wicker baskets that they would put the, the, the light under uh, that, that would give a nice kind of ambiance. But Jesus said in a dark house, when it's night, that's not what you do. You take the lamp and they had a wall plate fixed into the wall or they had a nook in the wall and they would put the lamp up on that nook. So that as it sets up high, it can shine the light out throughout the entire room. Jesus says, you are the light. And so therefore, don't ever put yourself and don't ever allow the light to be hidden away. But the light needs to be shown prominently so it can bring light to others. Can I tell somebody in the room today that for too long you've been hiding under a bushel? For too long, you've tried to let people cause you to hide what God has put on the inside of you. 
For too long, you've tried to let people make you ashamed, or you, you have let people make you ashamed for what God has made you. God has made you light. For too long, you have diminished your light. You've tried to tone it down so that you can make roaches feel comfortable. But at some point, you've got to let the light shine. Say amen, somebody. At some point, you have to realize who God made you. You have to realize what God put in you. You have to realize what God has purposed for you, what God has called you to. And if people talk about you, let them talk. But you shine on. If people don't like you, they'll have to get over it. Shine on. If people stop speaking to you, they don't have to talk to you. But you shine on and let God's power work in your life. Don't be ashamed of what God has called you to. Don't be ashamed of how God has changed you. People talking about, you, you think you're so holy. No, I don't think I'm so holy, but I serve a holy God, and I am dedicated. I'm committed. I'm, I'm given over to him, and I may not be all that I want to be. I may not be all that I need to be, but I thank God that I'm his, and he will do with me what he pleases in his time and in his way. To God be the glory. I got to close. John chapter 8, verse 4 and 5, we must do the works of him that sent us while it is day because night comes when no man, no woman can work. As long as I am in the world, this is what Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Man has tried to light his way with education, but yet things keep getting darker. Man has tried to light his way with financial independence, but yet the world keeps getting darker. Man has tried to light his way with humanism, but yet the world keeps getting darker. Man has tried to light his way with, with secularism, but yet the world keeps getting darker. Man has tried to light his way with technology, but yet the world keeps getting darker. Men's hearts keep getting colder. Men's minds keep getting more uh, uh, profane. Men's, men's attitudes become more against one another. Man cannot do it on his own. We need the light that comes from God. I close. I close with this. I close with this. Believers also have the task to show God's light and show him to be praiseworthy. Verse number 16 he says, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. We have been created children of God for good works. We have been established in Christ in order to do his work and do his will. Now, let me give you clarity and teach you very briefly that God did not save you for you to work for him. God did not save you for you to serve him. God did not save you for you to give anything to him. Theologically, I'm correct and this is why. Because if God had saved you for you to work for him, then he is no better than the common man. Because people do stuff for you to see what they can get in return. If God saved you for you to work for him, then it's not grace anymore. God saved you totally for one reason. He loves you. God loves you. If you are saved today, it is because God loves you. If you're going to get saved today, and I pray you do, it will be totally because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. If you get saved, it is because God loves you. If you are not saved, it's simply because you have not received and accepted the love that God has already providentially made available to you, the salvation that God has already fixed for you. You simply told God no. But God saves us because he loves us. But since he loved me, since he did so much for me, since God looked past my faults and saw my needs, since the scripture is true, but God hath commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, 
Now that word sinners is big because some folks like to dodge uh, the reality of that word. Some people when they say uh, uh, while we were yet sinners, they think about what everybody else did. But when you see that word, you ought to think not about what everyone else did. Think about the stuff you do. Did y'all catch my verb tense? I didn't say past tense, did. I, I said stuff you do. Stuff, stuff right now that's in your life that, that God is not pleased with. Guess what? God knew about it before his son went to the cross. And Jesus still decided to die for you. And since he loved you that much. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since he did all of that, guess what? The least you could do is serve him. I mean, that's the least you could do. I mean, I mean when, you, when you really start to think about that thing and, and you really start, start to really consider everything that God had to do and everything that God has, every way that God has loved you and everything that God has forgiven, it causes you to say, I'm glad to serve. I, I, I love my mama. I, I love my mother. And, and so, so uh, today, even though years ago she would have to compel me, even though she'd have to make me clean the house, even though she had to make me sweep the porch, even though she had to make me wash dishes, she had to make me do all of this stuff. Now that I'm a grown man, now that I know about all those bills she had to pay because I got to pay some of my own, <laughs> now that I know about the sacrifices that she had to make, now that I understand everything she went through to make me the man that I am today, I would drive two hours just to wash her dishes and sweep her carport because I appreciate what she done for me. And when you consider what God has done for you, it ought to make you do the same thing. God, whatever you want from me, I'm glad to do it. God, here's my life. Use me, Lord, to thy service. God, if you want me to serve, I'll serve you. If you want me to pray, I'll pray. God, whatever you want me to do, I'm just glad you saved me. I'm glad you love me. I'm glad you take care of me. I'm glad you watch over me. God, whatever you want, I'm glad to do it. Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 10 said, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has done so much in our lives that when God changes our lives, that what he does is he shows his handiwork. This phrase, we are his workmanship, it means an artist has gone into his studio. And he has made a work of art. And when he puts it on display, people admire the work of art, but they admire more the hands that made it. Can I tell you, when you live your life for God as a Christian disciple, you don't get the glory, but the man that's working on you. Do y'all see where I am? When people really know what God has brought you from, when they really see how God has changed you, when they really see the difference that God has made in your life, they don't praise you or they should not praise you. And if they do, you ought to immediately tell them, it ain't me. To God be. I got to go. But lights don't shine for themselves. Lights shine for others. And so when he says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. What Jesus literally says there, you're not shining for yourself. You're shining for somebody else. Lights never say, look at me. Lights say, look out there. Lights never want attention. Lights are made to illuminate. Are y'all with me here? And here's the thing about me and here's the thing about you. If you remember old style lanterns, lanterns worked by having a wick that went down in the oil and fire was struck to the wick. And as the oil is drawn up, the flame burns. And what you would do is you'd put, to contain the light, light, you'd put a globe on top of it. And it would shine. But the globe got dirty. But the light was still shining. The 
globe got soot on it, but the light was still shining. As long as there was oil in the lamp, the fire kept burning. But the globe would get dark sometimes. The globe wouldn't shine as bright sometimes. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to take the globe off and you'd have to wash it and scrub it so that the light could shine through. Can I tell you that sometimes people look at you and they don't think much of you, but the reality is don't worry about it if you just let the Lord work on you a little bit. The oil is still down in the lamp. Fire is still burning bright. But every now and then, I just need to be washed off so that the light can shine in me. Can I get a witness? So glad I've got the light of God's glory down in my heart. So glad I've got the power of God deep within. And he shines in my darkness. He shines throughout all of my mess. He shines in a dark world. So long now, we're going to watch the Super Bowl. But can I tell you this? I know somebody who wins every time because he always shines in the darkness. Can I get a witness? I've had dark days in my life, but the Lord shines so bright. I've had so many days when I couldn't find my way, but I'm glad I can sing with conviction. Jesus is the light that shineth in me. Can I get a witness? Is there anybody here glad that God gave you a light in your dark moments? Glad that God gave you a light in the distressful moments? Glad that God gave you a light when days got dark, when friends got few, when the night seems long? So glad that he shines Shine, oh, shine, hey, 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 hey. Oh. Oh. shine, deep in my heart. We're gone. Glory to God. I thank God for the light. I thank God that I am the light. The world needs you. Your family needs you to shine. Your place of work needs you to shine as a Christian. That doctor's office that you're going to they need you to shine as a Christian. Your neighborhood, they need you to shine as a Christian. If you have the spirit of God that is within you, that flame never goes out, but we can diminish its light shining because we don't clean ourselves up. We don't let the Lord get the soot off of us. But if you've got the Holy Spirit, you've got the oil. If you've got the fire burning in you, you've got to let it shine. Because people are trying to stumble in the dark. But if we turn on the light, people can find their way home. Children, as you go to school, young people, as you go to school, college students, as you go to school, you're going in dark places. And you may be the only light that somebody sees. Be sure to shine. This world is dying of hopelessness. But God has sent us to restore hope. He sent us to stop the decay and the destruction that we see. But if we won't do it, who will? If we won't serve, 
who will? If we won't shine, who will? If you're not a Christian, I pray that you'll get saved and you'll receive the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian or a believer, but you know that you have not been dedicated, and you know that you strayed away, will you please, my friend, will you please, my brother, my sister, will you rededicate your life to Jesus? If you, my friend, have moved from some other place and uh, you need a church home, I can firmly say that you'll search and you'll never find a perfect church. There's a church up there in Atlanta right around the corner from the AU Center that the name on the title is Perfect Church. But I guarantee if I met some of the members, I'd find out it's not a perfect church. No such thing as a perfect church. But, friend, you can be a part of the Lord's church and serve God. I pray that you'll shine brightly this week. I pray that you'll walk in the light, but not only walk in the light, but be the light. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, and may the Lord grant you his peace. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. All of God's children said amen, amen, amen. Barrett.